Thank you so much for your words, Vice Chancellor Toll. Those are very inspiring. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Marianne Mort. I'm a fourth year PhD student in electrical engineering here at UC Davis. Um, I work on an X-ray imaging device that looks at hard, fast X-rays coming out of nuclear fusion events at the National Ignition Facility. But I'm not here to talk about me. I'm here to introduce Samantha Fontaine. Uh, she's a wonderful ind individual, but also the Director of Technology for Social Impact at Analog Devices. Um, she's a passionate about accessibility and leveraging technology to engineer a brighter future for so society. She received her BS in Electrical and Computer Engineering from Worcester Polytechnic Institute and her MS in Engineering Management from Tufts University. Over her career, she has held various roles in product marketing and engineering in precision and high-speed technology groups, as well as led innovation programs out of the CTO office. In addition to her role at ADI, Samantha has also been a member of the Great Advisory Committee for the Analog Devices Foundation, as well as held various leadership roles in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and environmental committees. So we'll go ahead and give a welcoming hand to Samantha. So thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, I just want to let you all know it's actually pronounced Worcester. I am from the Boston, Massachusetts area, and I'm so happy to be here at UC Davis. So if there's one thing you've learned today, at least it's, it's called Worcester. <laughs> Today, I'm gonna to be walking through my journey and specifically the decision-making process that I went through the journey. But what I really want you to take away is that there's decisions and there's choices, and it's the choices and your values that are driving those decisions. And that there's a difference between a choice and a decision. Choices are very personal. They're values and belief-driven, and they are a precursor to the decisions. You will always make a choice before you make a decision. You've made so many choices today by just being here whether it's for the food or to actually hear what we're talking about. I don't care, I'm happy you're here. And the decisions are the effects and the outcomes of those choices. So you're facing a fork in the road and you have a few options in front of you. Option A, option B, and option C. Option A is a short path, option B is a longer, windier road, a beautiful journey, and option C is an elevator to the top. Each of you will have a different answer to this because you have a different belief in what matters to you. Some of you, value your time and your energy and your effort, and you want to take the elevator to the top right away. Some of you value the journey and the lessons going along the way, and you'll take option B. There's no right answer to this. There's never a right answer to the decisions you make, because it's very personal. This is what I want you to think a lot about today, is about those values, those beliefs, the choices you're given or not given, when we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how do you make those decisions, especially the difficult decisions? You guys have already made those decisions by being here at UC Davis studying engineering. What gets in the way of making those decisions is actually the accessibility gap. So let's look at the, the global world. It's 8 billion people in the world, and there are a lot of gaps when we talk about that. Here specifically with you in this room at UC Davis, 20% of you have access to a higher education. You're a part of 20% of the people in the world getting access to a higher education. Now you might think, okay, well, not everyone has to have a higher education to bring value into this world, and you're right. So let's talk about something a little bit more essential that all of us have a right to, and that's very valuable, and that's healthcare. 50% of the world has access to healthcare services. Think about the pandemic, the post-pandemic that we're in right now. Think about not having access to doctors, hospitals, vaccines, masks, you name it. They weren't given a choice or a decision. Those 50% were not given a choice. Some other gaps. Internet, where would we be without access to the internet? I remember that. I really like the internet, let me tell you. <laughs> Water and energy. That 90% looks really good up there. And you think, okay, that 10% gap, we're, we're closing that gap. Maybe it's in developing countries and we're working our way through. You guys are in California, I'm sure you're very familiar with rolling blackouts. 
is that really accessible? You have reliable, sustainable energy all the time. Everyone has access to power in their homes. These are wonderful statistics and numbers, but what I want you to think about today is the context behind everything. Context is so important. I often hear context is king, but I'm gonna tell you today, context is queen. <laughs> and the question you should be asking is, what does it mean to be accessible? What does access mean? What's the definition? Never assume that you understand what people are talking about. Is it truly binary? Is it you have it, you don't have it? It's not, it's very gray. We live in a very gray world. There are a lot of things that go into accessibility. First and foremost, it's the physical things that we have in life. It's the doctors, the hospitals, it's the vaccines, it's the masks. Once you have access to this infrastructure and these physical things, how do you use it? Do any of you know how to navigate health insurance? Are you experts in that? I don't know about you, but it's a little confusing. So education is so important. And last but not least, and the biggest gap of it all, is the affordability. You go to the doctors once, twice, what happens if you find you have a disease? How do you continue to, conti continue to keep sustaining that? This is my value, this is what I care about. I didn't know this in the beginning of my, my journey and my career. I'm just now coming to terms with it. And this is really powerful for me to make those decisions. And it's what I do today at Analog Devices. I focus on taking our technology, partner with customers and organizations to close those gaps. And at Analog Devices, we are focusing on a lot of different ad applications and markets. We are looking at the energy. We are looking at communications. We are looking at automotive. But I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that healthcare because that number is a little scary. So at ADI, the way we like to describe what we do is we bridge the physical and the digital world because the world is very analog, it's very gray, and we have to measure what's happening. We have to sense, measure, interpret, and provide that information to you. We have to make sense of what's happening. So in a healthcare example, what this looks like is your health wellness journey, right? You start off by being able to measure your health and your wellness. You know, how am I doing? Traditionally, you go to a doctor's maybe once a year. Some of you probably don't. I know I don't always make it to the doctor's office. But using technology such as, you know, Fitbit on my watch or your Apple watches that you probably are wearing, we're being constantly monitored, measuring the number of steps we're taking, our heart rate, maybe our pulse ox, you name it. We're constantly measuring that information. And so we're not just getting one data point once in our lives. We're getting continuous trending of data. And using hardware to be able to precisionly measure that data, convert that data, analyze that data, send that data out to you as a user is so incredibly important so that you can make the decision what you want to do at your health. Not an insurance company, but you. So we're empowering you with information so that you can make the right choices, so that you can have a choice on what your outcome looks like. So at ADI, we've been, for over 50 years, making amazing hardware technology and sensing, measuring, processing, powering. Of course, this needs to survive a very long time. I haven't charged my Fitbit in like a month. <laughs> but it's more than that, right? If I just gave you the raw data, the ones and zeros out of this, what do you do with that information? It's not quite useful. It's not quite accessible. It needs to be intuitive, it needs to be easy to use. And so what you need to do is you need to provide more value on top of that. So hardware is great, we live in a hardware world, we're never leaving this hardware world, it's very physical, we'll always need to have the hardware. But it's the software that adds additional value around that. It's the security. This is your healthcare data on here, and it's going to the cloud, it's going somewhere, it needs to be safe, it's your data privacy. Hardware encryption is a perfect way of providing security, software security wrapping around that. Algorithms to be able to process and analyze what, what you're doing with that information, and using AI machine learning to not only early detect, but to determine what you're, what's gonna happen with that information. So to give you an example of vital signs monitoring at Analyze Devices, we are partnering with a company out of Europe to be able to use our base platform to measure and understand epileptic seizures. For those of you who don't know, one in a thousand people die of an epileptic seizure every year. There's still a lot we don't know. And so if you can use everyday wearable monitoring and you use 
the algorithms, and the machine learning, you can understand what's happening and early predict what's happening to each individual user. Like we talked about, everybody's different, which is why it's so important that when you're creating these solutions, that you're using a diverse audience to test it, to make it, to derive it, to create these algorithms, to make sure that you're not losing the audience. Because when we were first creating these watches, do you know who missed out? Do you know who was not a part of a lot of this? A lot of minorities. I don't know if you don't know, but reflective technology isn't really great on dark skin. It's not great on really dry skin. It's not great in certain temperature and environments. And so you need people to continue to innovate on that hardware solution using software to help wrap it around it. So let's talk a little bit about my journey and how I've gotten here today. So how, how did I learn about accessibility? Why, why is it my personal belief and value? And why do I care so much about it? And I'm pretty sure a lot of you here today also value this. When I took a step back and thought about this, it all began in high school. My brother and I are first generation high school graduates. Both my parents and grandparents did not go to high school. When I went to school, my brother went to a normal high school, and I went, hmm, what are the odds that I'm going to make something out of a, an education from here? So I actually went to a trade high school. I went to a vocational high school so that I could actually make a trade out of it. So I'm always thinking about these different outcomes and possibilities. So it was the first choice and decision that I made, give me as many options as I can possibly have to be successful. The second choice that I made was studying electronics. And I'd be lying if I said I found electronics right away and it was so exciting. I actually wanted to do masonry. I wanted to build chimneys and patios. I had spent two weeks and I told my dad, I'm going to do this forever. This is so exciting. And he went, mm, keep trying. Trust me, when you're 40 and 50 years old and you're out in the hard cold, you're not going to be wanting to build patios. It's a great hobby, but it's not meant for everybody. Keep trying. If you try and you go through others, and you come back and you say, this is meant for me, then great, but I want you to try. My dad was the first example of a mentor to provide me with guidance. And he is one of the many men that have been my mentors. I actually don't have any, I have a female mentor now, but throughout my career, it's always been men that have been helping and being a great ally and a supporter. I went on a linear journey, right? You graduate from high school, you go to college. Well. I didn't know how to go to college. Luckily, the electronics shop that I was in, the professors helped me. My math teacher helped me. How do you figure out what college to go to? How do you navigate it? I can't afford it. All these challenges. But I made it. I'm obviously here today. And the same thing happened when I was in college. I couldn't afford it. I got great scholarships. But I had to work multiple jobs while I was going through school. So it was not easy. It was a big uphill battle. I like to joke that I felt like I was set up for failure, but I was going to do it anyways, because I had something to prove, right? I was first generation high school graduate, now I'm a first generation college graduate. If I can do it, my cousins and nieces and nephews can do it. So I studied electrical and computer engineering at WPI back in the East Coast. I actually started off with studying robotic and electrical and computer engineering, because I really like robots. Back in high school, I participated in a lot of BattleBots competitions. For those of you who are not familiar with it, you build robots, they destroy each other, you figure out how to make it work again, and so on and so forth. First, robotics was fun. BattleBots is way more fun to destroy things. <laughs> so I thought I was going to work on robotics, creating assistive technology to help people with different disabilities and challenges, and bring more accessibility to the world. However, I definitely bit off more than I could chew. Doing a double major and working multiple jobs was not easy. And so for those of you who are not familiar, a lot of the background for robotic engineering is actually electronic and computer engineering. And so I decided I'll find my own way just through electrical and computer engineering. And I also had a really strong advisor and mentor in the electronics program. I like to call him my Obi-Wan Kenobi. I think all of you should have an Obi-Wan Kenobi. This is the guru that will help you hone your craft, sharpen that tool. If you don't have an Obi-Wan Kenobi, look out for it. They helped me figure out how to navigate my path. They gave me opportunities. They allowed me to participate in different labs in the building. And because of that, I navigated towards the semiconductor world. I didn't go out and find it. I just happened to end up in it. It's not an amazing story. It just is what it is. And so because of these different opportunities in the labs I was participating in, Analog Devices was one of the key sponsors for these labs. 
And so naturally through all this work and being a lab rat, and I'm, I'm always a lab rat at heart, I know earlier they had talked about that, I had created an internship at, at ADI, working in the lab with them, and eventually it turned into a full-time job. And I always thought I was going to be a lab rat. I had spent many years in the lab doing product and test development engineering. And so for those of you who are unfamiliar with that in the semiconductor world, you have a wafer, you probe it, you test it, you slice it and dice it, you package it, you test it. Test, 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 test. Is it working? Is it functional? Has it high quality? You're always testing that and you're always saying, is it the best that it's always going to be? And I'm really good at it and I really enjoy that continuous improvement process. And during that journey, I had a lot of people tell me, this isn't the right job for you. Not because I wasn't good at it. It was not because I wasn't good at it. It's because I always kept asking the questions of, how are they using it? What else do they need? What do they care about? And they go, that's not a product and test engineer's job. That's a marketing and a sales and an applications job. You need to go into those jobs. And I went, oh, I'm not a sales or a business person. Mm, keep me in the lab. Keep me in the lab. And so I continued on my journey until I was approached with an engineering challenge that the company had provided. It's called the Global Early Employee Challenge, or GEEK. And a part of that challenge was to bring technology to solve a global challenge. And we were facing a food security crisis. And so I was focusing on, well, we're putting a bunch of technology into agricultural farms, but no one's watching what happens. You spent all this beautiful time and energy making this wonderful food. And then you put it into a truck and you send it to a market and you don't know what happens to it. So why not have a blockchain solution that can monitor that throughout the whole process? And so when I first started working on that, I was focusing on the technology and the solution. And slowly, my team was so much further ahead working on that that someone had to do the marketing. And so someone had to step up. And so that someone was me. And I loved it. <laughs> Funny enough, I loved it. I absolutely loved doing the marketing side of it. I loved understanding what is the real value I'm bringing here? What's the market size? What is the strategic control? And so I pivoted in my career. And I moved to marketing. And I also went back to school to do an engineering management because I never thought I was going to do an MBA. And I never thought I was going back to school in general. I was done. I was like, pay to go to school or get paid. So getting paid sounds a lot better. <laughs> and while I was at my engineering management degree program at Tufts, I had spent a lot of time learning about marketing and business strategy and so on and so on. And it was the personal leadership development class that was by far the biggest growth opportunity. It's where I learned about my personal values and beliefs. I had to take a step back and really understand who I am. It's the soft stuff. The soft stuff is so important. There's a famous saying out there in a university research that talked about 85% of successful people and businesses is because of the strong soft skills combined with additional 15% of the technical knowledge. During all this time, I had an executive leader in the company continue to give me opportunity after opportunity to show myself and to show what kind of value I can bring to the company. For those of you who don't know, that's called a sponsor. It took me five years to realize that's what he was doing. <laughs> but he would give me an opportunity after an opportunity to grow and to show that I can bring value. And for those of you who don't know, executives don't make it easy. They don't line it out exactly what they want from you. They're very ambiguous. They have big visions, and they say, go, be bold, be brave, be fabulous, and solve this problem. They don't tell you how to do it. The team that you need, the budget you need, any of the systems and solutions around it, you have to figure that out. It's very scary to move in a world where everyone tells you what to do, and where to be, and how to be a part of the team, to then having to navigate and figure that all out. This is when I started really growing as a leader. And I was quite good at it. And oftentimes, I look back and I'm very happy that I said yes to all these opportunities. Because saying yes makes you be brave, even if you're terrified. It forces you to figure it out, to be innovative. And through all those processes, I was offered an opportunity to be a part of our Analog Devices Foundation committee. It was the first time we had created a foundation at the company. No one knew what they were doing. There's a big difference between being a part of a foundation and being part of a company. They're both business-driven, but different mindsets. And so I had to completely pivot my mindset of marketing and selling something to how do I provide a sense of well-being to society and support that I'm not just trying to sell something to them, but trying to sell a, a picture, a vision. 
and eventually I ended up where I am today in my career. But it took a lot of yes, saying yes, a lot of safety to, to try, a lot of ambiguity, and not having all of the answers. And what guided me through this whole process was my personal values and beliefs. That if I don't do it, then someone else might not have the opportunity. I need to bring that accessibility to this. I have to think about it. I'm a, you know, a woman in this field. I need to grow and lead so that other women can see me growing and leading. It's very terrifying, and you don't think you're doing a great job. And many of you are probably sitting here thinking, what is my life going to look like? And we're always thinking that. But trust me, you know, you're just as fabulous and well-deserving of all of this. Quick cat break, cat nap. Bring you guys back. It's my cat Frankie. Just want to wrap it up, but I always find it's nice to mentally come back to the stage here. So three things that we talked about. First, say yes for success, no to grow. Sounds a little contradicting, I know. So let me explain what I meant. Yes to all the opportunities you're presented. No, you don't have to say yes to all those opportunities. You have to have a yes mindset. You have to be open to new ideas to new opportunities, to the new ways of thinking, to new teams. If you don't think yes all the time, then you're missing out and you're not providing value. When you become a leader, you have to have a yes mindset. This is a way to empower teams to become more innovative, more collaborative. It's a way to be more fearless and courageous, get you out of that comfort zone. But the real growth is when you learn to say no. I was a yes queen. I said yes, yes, yes to everything that came my way because I wanted to grow and have so many opportunities and lead and try and fail and learn. But eventually I learned after a while, there's only so many things you can juggle and there's only so many things you can do well. There's two to three things you can do well in life. There's additional pieces that can go around that. But remember, there's two to three things you can do. And if the other things are not giving you energy, they're sucking the energy and life out of you, it's not aligning with your values, and it's not aligning with your goals or your plans, drop them. I don't care who it is, what it is, where it is, just drop it. It's not worth it. That's a hard lesson until the swallow, and I'm still learning that. I don't let go very easily. <laughs> Talked a bit about this. Ambiguity. How many times have you guys faced ambiguity? When you get into the real world, there's a lot of ambiguity because you're innovating, you're leading, you're changing it. If you're in research, you can look at what other people are doing, but you're paving the way. It's all ambiguous. It's all different. It's all new. But eventually, you have to be decisive and try it. You can't keep waiting on more and more information. You're never going to have all the information. So the best way to close those gaps in that information, again, fall back on your values, your core gut instinct. When you tell yourself, you know, am I doing the right thing, you'll never have regrets if it's tied to your values. You'll never have regrets if it's tied back to your values. Lastly, this is my favorite, feedback is a gift. If you're in college and you're getting grades and you're always getting feedback, you're getting feedback and you're, you're doing a really good job, maybe you've got to change, you've got to improve, but you're always getting feedback. When you get out into the real world, you might not always get feedback. You're paid to do your job. If you're not doing your job well, you'll probably hear about it. But if you're doing a good job, you might not hear it. So make sure that when you are going out there, that you're setting yourself up for success by getting feedback. It doesn't mean you have to bring everything in and say, yeah, that's true. No, you just have to have a yes mindset and be open. Yes, OK, I'm open to feedback. What you're giving to me is a gift. Maybe I should reflect upon that and do something about it. I probably would have pivoted back into marketing if I wasn't so close-minded to the idea a lot sooner. I don't regret my decisions of not doing that, but when I reflect back, I would have moved faster. And there's many other areas in my life where I could have taken the feedback and the advice. I did early on with my father, but in my career I was a little bit more stubborn. <laughs> and surround yourself with mentors and a support network, not just in your professional life, in your personal life. Life gets really hard when you're doing a career in your personal life. It gets really hard to juggle and balance. You guys have a, a very strong opportunity to be surrounded with so many friends and so many things that are happening right now. When you get out there, life gets very busy, and it's really important to make sure you have that support system. I always tell people there's four types of mentors or support that you want. The first is your cheerleader, someone in your corner telling you, yeah, 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 you're fabulous, you're great, you're great, you're great, no matter what's happening in your head. Yeah, 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 you're going to be great. You always want that cheerleader. Builds you up. 
The second is your Obi-Wan Kenobi. It's your technical person to go to. The third is that sound wall that you can bounce, that you feel safe, that you can bounce ideas off of. And the last, and it's not truly a mentor, is a sponsor. As you're navigating, find that person that's gonna pull you up with new opportunities and keep raising you up and raising you up. It's a very different from mentors. Sponsors are very different. They're hard to come by. You might not recognize what they're doing right away. It might take you five years, like someone here, but it's important. So as you begin to make more decisions, whether it's what you eat today, what you wear, where you're gonna go later, what you're gonna do for your next job or internship or co-op, remember to reflect back onto your choices and your personal values because that will help you decide those hard decisions. It will help you determine, you know, is this the right career path am I gonna make? It's me doing battle bots. I'm in a wafer fab in a clean room, by the way. Clean rooms are the cleanest place, so during the pandemic, it's super safe. At a conference representing some of the technology I worked on, and as I started moving into my career path doing tech for good. Very happy in all of these roles, as you can see. No regrets, no decisions, no mistakes. And no matter how many times you make decisions, no matter how much energy, money, and effort you put into it, you can always change it. You can always change it. Do not freak out about that. You can always change it. Just go with your gut instinct, your values, and it will always go well. Thanks. Hello. Thank you, Samantha. Before she steps down, I wanted to see if there was any questions from the audience. No requirement to me. Okay. I'll be around, so feel free to come up and talk to me. Thank you.